examples of all sagittal and coronal approaches to the skull base through the nose. We, uh, we know that to reach the skull base, we can follow several, uh, several corridors from, uh, uh, from anterior and also from the lateral skull base. And we know also that the transnasal corridor is the pivotal, uh, the pivot of the of the of these uh, specific anatomical areas of the anterior skull base, middle skull base, and posterior skull base, and we can um, we can divide the approaches to the skull base in the so-called sagittal uh, sagittal approaches to the ventral skull base, and to coronal approaches to the adjacent areas and to more lateral areas of the skull base itself. And so we can uh, summarize these sagittal approaches for different uh, midline areas and lateral, for the lateral areas, the so-called coronal approaches. And so the first part of my presentation will be focused on the sagittal plane approaches, starting from anteriorly and so from the posterior plate of the frontal sinus to the um, craniocervical junction. And so all the different, these different approaches allow us to pass through the nose and to reach different areas of the ventral skull base. The first one that has been described in the literature is the so-called transfrontal approach and allow us to reach the posterior plate of the frontal sinus uh, looking, for the, uh, looking for the nasal bolt and the, our landmarks are the septal branch of the anterior mandible artery and the first olfactory phyla. And in this way, we perform a so-called draft-free procedure in order to expose the, the, front, the posterior wall of frontal sinus. And after that, if we need, we can also open the dura and expose the intracranial structures. This is a possible example of what I'm speaking to you, what I'm, uh, I'm explaining to you. This is the big meningoencephalocele of the foramen sequel that we approach with this transfrontal approach. If we go a little bit posterior, we can uh, uh, define the very well-known transcript reform approach uh, that allows us to reach this area of the skull base, but if you look very precisely, you can speak about a transfrontal transcribed from a transplanum approach because most of the time when you treat sinonasal tumors of this area, you also extend your approach a little bit anterior and a little bit posterior. Just to show some anatomical pictures that describe this approach, starting from anterior, these are the two frontal sinuses opening in a draft-free procedure, the nasal septum and the two middle turbinates. Now we are cutting the nasal septum in order to better expose all the nasal fossa. Now you, you can see this nice picture with the, middle, the two middle turbinates, the nasal septum that was previously resected, and the two inferior turbinates, coanas, and the removal of the two middle turbinates and all the tmoidal complex bilaterally that has been removed in a centripetal resection way. You can see the anterior ethmoidal arteries. Here we have the posterior ethmoidal arteries that are in the skull base in the specimen, sphenoid sinuses and frontal sinuses anteriorly. Now we are removing the mucosa of the, olf uh, the olfactory mucosa in order to expose also the bone of the cribriform plates. And if you need, you can also remove the lamina papyracea bilaterally in order to expose the periorbit bilaterally. And you, after the cutting of the ethmoidal arteries, you remove the bone of the ethmoidal roof and cribriform plates in order to expose the underlying dura. And removing of the cristagalli is another very important step, otherwise you cannot remove the dura if it is needed. And this is the area where the cristagalli is, um, is, uh, was removed. This is another very important step whenever you have to remove the dura. This is the lateral view with a 45 degrees. You have always to remember on the margin of your bony defect, you have to dissect very well the dura from the surrounding bone. This is because after removal of the dura will be very difficult to put your layer of reconstruction if you don't 
perform this, uh, this section before removal of the dura. Now here we removed, we opened the dura bilaterally exposing the frontal lobes and the branches of the medial orbital frontal arteries. And we are cutting now the folks. And this is the last view of our transcribed from approach with both the frontal lobes uh, well exposed. This is a, uh, just a very fast example of, uh, of uh, application of uh, transcribed from approach from an intestinal type adenocarcinoma of the right nasal fossa. I just skipped to the uh, focus of this, uh, of this procedure when the tumor was already removed from the nose, but in order to reach free margins, we had also to remove the skull base. On the right side, you can see, on the left side, sorry, you can see that we are preparing the skull base. We cut uh, on, on both sides and, and it, the moidal arteries. Now we are removing the bony. You, are, you see that we detach very well the dura from the surrounding bone. On the right side, very carefully, we are Opening the dura, remember that the, the arachnoid is very adherent to the branches of the middle or front, uh, middle or middle frontal artery, and so you have to very carefully dissect the arachnoid from the from this vessel in order to avoid very dangerous dangerous bleeding. Now I'm cutting the olfactory tract bilaterally. You can see, and so the olfactory bulbs are both included in the specimen. We skip to the next uh, approach, the so-called transplanum transtuberculum approach. With such an approach, we, uh, we access into the sphenoid sinus. You see bilaterally, this is the tuberculum cella, this is the, the, the planum sphenoidale, and this is how we're opening with exposure of the dura after the removal of the, of the, um, of the bone. Here you can see uh, our window with the optic chiasm, the two optic nerves, and this is a magnification of the optic chiasms with the pituitary stoke, and these are the branches of the anterior superficial uh, arteries, very important branches to be preserved in such an approach. And another magnification, the optic chiasm, the, the uh, medial orbital frontal artery and FBA, a1, A2, this is the optic tract, optic chiasm, optic nerve, pituitary stoke. And if you go uh, above the chiasm, you can also reach the third ventricle and navigate inside the third ventricle. You can see the thalamus, the, uh, the interthalamus adhesion, the moro foramen, and the access to the third ventricle. This is a classic example of, of uh, transplanum. Uh, tran, uh, transplanum transtuberculum approach. This is a craniopharyngioma, infundibular craniopharyngioma, in which the tumor origin from the infundibulum. And so here we are opening our window, we are exposing the dura, we are removing the tuberculum. Now we are opening the window into the, uh, into the uh, uh, intracranial space. You see here, this is the chiasm. And this is the surface of the lesion. Now we are opening the lesion and very, very gently we are starting to remove piece by piece the lesion. And after that, we start to find the plane in between the anatomical structures and, and the lesion. In this step of surgery, you have to be very careful, especially in order to preserve, as you can see here, some branches of the uh, superior anterior hypophysial artery that is here. And if you can preserve, it's always better in order to not have problem of vision after surgery. And so we are pulling very carefully and at the same time dissecting the, the capsule of the lesion in order to remove uh, the, all the lesion itself. Here we are doing, uh, uh, after the removal of the lesion, a view of the surgical field. Now the so-called transcellular approach. The transcellular approach is the classic approach to reach the cella and so the pituitary gland and this is the classic approach that we use to treat pituitary adenomas. These are the so-called four blues, the intercavernous sinuses and the cavernous sinuses. This is our door to the cella and to the pituitary gland. And this is the classic view after the opening of the periosteum of the cella. This is um, uh, 
typical case of uh, micro GH microadenoma. I want to stress how much is important to extend our opening of the sphenoid sinus to the uh, floor of the sphenoid. Otherwise, you don't have enough space to move your, your instruments. You remove the bone that cover the periosteum of the, of the pituitary gland. We always open and remove all the bone till to the uh, cavernous sinus here and cavernous sinus here. After that, we open the dura in such a case in which we have a very small uh, pituitary adenoma on the left side. We, we perform a quite target resection, and so we found the lesion, and after the removal of the lesion, we uh, explorate inside in order to be uh, sure about our cross total resection. And now we start with the posterior skull base. Uh, and so you, we can divide the clivus in three thirds. The first one is the transdorsal approach. And so this is the pituitary gland, the chiasm, the dorsum cell that is our door in this approach, and the intracranial structures. You can see the basilar artery behind the anterior pontine membrane, and the third cranial nerve between the posterior cerebral artery and superior cerebral artery. And this is just an example of a clinical application. This is a clival cordoma, clivus cordoma of the, of the dorsum cellae. This is the cella. And you can see how we remove progressively the lesion, um, taking advantage of a, a compression of the pituitary gland superiorly. And on the other side, with the suction tube, we remove progressively and we expose all the dura. This patient had also a six cranial nerve parsi that was here on the right side, and we decompressed the, also the, the nerve. Uh, we have the second portion here of the clivus, which you see here uh, the cellar prominence, the two uh, paraclival carotid arteries, and this is the door of this approach. You can see the intracranial stu structures, the pons and the basilar artery, the, the superior cerebellar artery, and so the structure that you can reach with uh, such an approach. This is an example, clinical example, of a typical disease that gives CSF, that is echordosis fissalifora. This is a remnant of the notochor uh, notochordal remnant that can give CSF because the presence of null in the dura, as you can see in this movie. This is the lesion, it's green because of the flourishing. Now we are removing progressively the flourishing, uh, the, the lesion that is like a gel. Uh, in a, is, a, is a little bit solid sometimes, and in other part of the lesion, you can also have a gel co component. This is the natural hole in the dura due to the presence of the lesion. After that, we explore intradurally uh, here to remove the uh, residual lesion, the component intradural, and you can see the basilar artery here. Now we are removing the intradural component very carefully because of the branches of the basilar artery for the pons. And after that, after the removal of the lesion, a gasket seal reconstruction with fat and cartilage in order to ensure a complete uh, closure of the defect. And we also put nasoceptive flap. The last uh, clival portion is uh, rich by the so-called lower clivus approach. Uh, and you can see here all the structure, extradural structure that can be reached. And so the jugular tubercle, the hypoglossal nerve, the occipital condyle, and behind the BBJ with, with the vertebral arteries and the uh, medulla oblongata. This is an example of a lower clivus cordoma. This is the nasal view uh, from the coana, the lesion was here in the from the posterior wall of the nasopharynx you could uh, see the prominence of the lesion we are performing our corridor th through the nose now we are uh, we are resecting the uh, rostrum sphenoidale the lesion is here lower and we can start to see the lesion this is the nasopharyngeal flap that we also remove later because in contact with the lesion. And we are opening better the sphenous sinus. And this, this 
is the lesion that was pushed down. We are drilling off the bone of the lower clivus here, and we proceed inferiorly, taking advantage also of the, of the transoral corridor, and we cover all the cavity with a nasoceptal flap. The last uh, sagittal approach uh, before the, the CASAM line, that is our limit for transnasal approach in the sagittal view, is the so-called transodontoid approach for malformation of the cerebral, of the cervical, um, of the odontoid. You can see here the, the view after the uh, harvesting of the nasopharyngeal flap. You can see the arch of the atlas. This is the odontoid process. We remove after two osteotomies, the arch of the atlas, and so we expose the odontoid process. You can see all the ligaments, the apical, the alar, and the transverse ligament. Here we have the lateral, um, the lateral bodies, the lateral masses of the atlas, and uh, the tectorium membrane, and the dura of the craniocervical junction. And so the medulla oblongata behind the uh, dura after the opening of the dura. Now we change our, our perspective and we, st we start to speak about the coronal approaches because we finish all the uh, sagittal approaches uh, before. Um, uh, the, um, there are yes, so I have uh, the four proceeding for the next steps. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, some um, nuances for such approaches. Uh, are you using uh, a Doppler during those kind of uh, procedures? Uh, in the, especially in the uh, while approaching the spinal sinuses and those kind of uh, lesions. So, and second of all, are um, uh, are you using other um, instrumentation for such lesions, like uh, not only uh, angled uh, uh, endoscopes, by, but also other um, instruments that are uh, curved to approach such lesions? Yes, for the first question, uh, of course, uh, the use of Doppler is uh, mandatory and is a very, very uh, simple instrument, but uh, is uh, the most important instrument in such a, uh, approaches whenever you, you work uh, very, very close to especially carotid artery and is uh, especially for lesions that we will see later for coronal approaches is most important the Doppler than, uh, than the intraoperative navigation because when you are speaking about soft tissues and tumors, when you remove the tumors, the anatomy always changed during the procedure. And so something that could be useful is the intraoperative MRI or CT scan. But for, for uh, during your procedure, the use of Doppler ultrasound, especially when you when you perform surgery in the cavernous sinus for big pituitary adenomas or in the nasopharynx, as we will see later, for nasopharyngeal tumors, for parapharyngeal carotid artery. Yes, Doppler is mandatory. You cannot perform this surgery without it. Yes, you need all kind of, uh, all kind of uh, instrumentation for, for skull base. And also during the, the last year, we are also improving our uh, maneuverability, taking advantage also of some uh, uh, orders that can give you an help. Uh, we, are, we are working on a, a robotic holder, especially for transphenol surgery, that hold, um, that hold the endoscope and uh, give you the possibility to have a real forehand technique because you are usually you can use free hands because one hand is for the scope. And you can also, with this new device, move the scope with your feet. And so this is one of the, of the instruments that could be uh, in, uh, in our very, very close future. Uh, another very important uh, instrument, and then we will go uh, forward with our presentation, uh, are not instruments, but devices like uh, surgery flow and flow seal and hemostatic agents that are uh, also mandatory because especially for surgery of cavernous sinus or in transpterygoid approaches whenever you open um, pterygoid plexus, uh, venous plexus, the bleeding sometimes is very difficult to control and with such a uh, such a gel you can control in, in two, three minutes uh, also very massive bleeding that can uh, 
be very also dangerous if uh, it's, it's uh, prolonged in, in time of surgery. Perfect, thank you, go ahead. You're welcome. Uh, what about coronal approaches? Now we have our, our trip along the midline, now we go laterally uh, towards the uh, lateral areas of the skull base and surrounding structures. Uh, first of all, we have to understand that we have two very important doors, the maxillary sinus and the pterygoid process behind it, that are our door to the coronal, to the coronal approaches. And uh, we recently described several uh, modular uh, opening of the maxillary sinus from the type 8, the type D, endoscopic medial maxillectomies in order to reach uh, different areas put in uh, um, um, different areas of the coronal of the coronal plane, starting from the standard opening of the maxillary sinus and so an inferior anxinectomy, we can enlarge uh, our in the right side our middle antrostomy till the palatine bone be in posteriorly the inferior turbinate inferiorly the tmoidal bulla and roof of the maxillary sinus superiorly and the nasolacrimal duct anteriorly. It is the smaller aperture in oncologic surgery for coronal approaches, the so-called type A endoscopic maxillectomy. For the type B, we sacrifice the inferior turbinate and we remove the medial wall of the maxillary sinus, leaving intact the nasolacrimal duct. In this way, you can improve your opening into the maxillary sinus. And if you want to have also more space, you can also to, to cut the nasolacrimal duct and remove the remnant of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus. You see how much you can improve your visualization of the maxillary sinus itself with a type C endoscopic maxillectomy. If you need more, you can also remove part of the piriform aperture and anterior wall maxillary sinus. Your landmark in this, in this step is the identification of, of the infraorbital nerve in the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus, and you can remove the bone of the anterior wall. In this way, this is the infraorbital nerve. This is the right side maxillary sinus. You, key, you, can, you see how much is, is very nice, your view with a zero degree endoscope after this procedure. And so this is the more, more extensive procedure. And so with a modular approach, you can progressively expose um, far lateral areas towards the skull base because the areas that we have to reach are behind the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. I think that this is the most important slides of this second part of my presentation. You have to remember your landmarks, the infraorbital nerve. When you, you, you don't, when finish the canal of the infraorbital nerve to the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, you have this vertical line. If you stay medial to it and superior to it, you have the first layer behind the maxillary sinus posterior wall, you have the inferior orbital fissure. Behind it, the critical wing of the sphenoid. Behind it, the middle cranial fossa. If you stay inferior to this line and medial to this one, you have before you have the pterygopalatine fossa. Behind it, you have the pterygoid roots, the pterygoid plates, and the pterygoid fossa. And behind it, the upper parapharyngeal space. Medially to this line, you have the temporal muscle and lateral pterygoid muscle, and superiorly, the orbit. And so remember this because it's very, very important. And so we know that if we open progressively and modularly the maxillary sinus, we can reach progressively more lateral and more caudal areas. And now we start with our trip towards the, all the anatomical uh, regions that we have behind the posterior maxillary wall. We start with the pterygopalatine fossa. You can follow also this arrow to understand where we are. We start opening the sphenopalatine foramen because this is the only access that we have uh, to the pterygopalatine fossa. With the carison pins, we can remove all the bone. Remember, always preserve the periosteum as first step because this is an avascular plane and so allow you to, to work without blood. Uh, and so this is the sphenopalatine artery, the descending palatine uh, bundle. And behind the periosteum, here we open the periosteum, you have the fat and the vessels and the nerves. After removal of the fat, you can see all the anatomy of the maxillary 
artery and all the branches. You can see the median artery that go towards the uh, median canal that is here, deep in the pleuric palatine fossa, this maxillary artery, the, the deep palatine artery, the lesser palatine artery, the sphenopalatine artery, the branches for the septum, for the middle turbinate, for the inferior turbinate, the infraorbital artery, and the deep temporal artery. So you see it very complex uh, vascular anatomy. You can also uh, have a look of your ne neural anatomy. This is V2 with the forame rotundum, the median nerve with the median canal, the pterygopalatine ganglium, and the deep palatine nerve, the lesson palatine nerve, the infraorbital nerve. You know how much is complex the anatomy of the, uh, of the pterygopalatine fossa. This is just a, an example of access to the, uh, to the pterygopalatine fossa on the, on the left side. This is a neural lesion of the, of the pterygopalatine fossa, a schwannoma of the median nerve. I'm, I'm performing a type C endoscopic maxillectomy. I cut the nasolacrimal duct because the tumor was going quite laterally. And so I perform, after performing uh, the endoscopic medial maxillectomies, I expose all the periosteum of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. Now I'm removing the last portion of the palatine bone. This is a very important step. And you have always to remember that when you have lesions that come from posteriorly, the periosteum of the posterior wall is always preserved. And so to reach the lesion, you have to open the periosteum. You know, now I'm opening the periosteum. This is the sphenopalatine artery, probably, that I'm clipping. I cut the vessel that stay anterior to the lesion, and after opening of the periosteum, a cutting of the vessel, I can reach the lesion that is all extended in the pterygopalatine fossa and uh, along uh, the um, the median canal because it was a uh, uh, schwannoma uh, that origin from the median canal. You see that I'm removing the last portion of the lesion in the median area. Here I'm pulling the last portion of the lesion. After that, I drill all the cavity. And so this is how our pterygopalatine fossa completely, uh, uh, with, with uh, complete removal of our lesion. And so now we go uh, forward. We have the pterygopalatine fossa, very small here. Now we go towards the infratemporal fossa. This is the maxillary artery, the fat in the infratemporal fossa. When you remove the fat, you can identify the pelvis of the temporal muscle in this direction. And in that direction, uh, more medially, you have the bellies, the horizontal bellies of the uh, lateral pterygoid muscles. This is the lateral pterygoid muscle, the inferior belly, the superior belly, and the bellies of the temporal muscle. Now we can identify different corridors. If you go in between the bellies of the temporal muscle, you can reach the coronoid process of the mandible. If you go in between the bellies of the temporal muscle and the pterygoid muscle in this fissure, you open, you go, you go forward in this direction, you can identify the condyle process of the mandible. This is the articular disc uh, and the ATM. This is the lateral pterygoid muscle and the, media, and the temporal muscle. If you go, the, you can find also a third corridor. This is the lateral pterygoid plate and the insertion of the lateral pterygoid muscle. And if you uh, dissect progressively in this direction, you can start to see the first anterior branches of the of the of V3. This is the buccal nerve. If you progressively dissect, you identify the foramen ovale with the with V3 here. This is the, the lateral pterygoid muscle. This is the greater wing of the sphenoid and the lateral pterygoid plate. If you clean better, you can see all the structures of V3 and the posterior division with the lingual nerve, the inferior alveolar nerve, the mitohyoid nerve. This is the middle meningeal artery. You can see better in the next the middle meningeal artery, the regular temporal nerve that from V3 go behind the condyle of the, of the mandible and the maxillary artery. This is an example of a, uh, another schwannoma, malignant schwannoma of V3 that was previously treated transcervical, but they, didn't wear, uh, they were not able to reach it, and so we approach it endoscopically. We started with an endoscopic medial maxillectomy. This is uh, the median nerve already we proceed to expose the pterygopalatine fossa. This is the pterygoid root, 
okay, you see this is the contact of the pterygopalatin fossa. Now we clip the pterygopalatin artery uh, and probably the maxillary artery, but I don't remember exactly if it was already the maxillary artery, but now I, we clean all the pterygoid root and now we go in that corridor, the last corridor that I described you. Okay, here we have the lateral pterygoid muscle and the pterygoid and the lateral pterygoid plate here. If you follow it, you go directly to V3 and foramen ovale. We uh, remove partially the pterygoid in this way. We have more space to work and this is the lesion. Here, this is an example. Whenever you, you work in this area, you have a lot of bleeding because there is also a big uh, venous plexus in the area of V3 and the use of, uh, of uh, surgi flow or flow seal is very useful to control the bleeding. Like here you see, this is the typical bleeding and this is flow seal. After that, we, you push two minutes and then you have a very, very clean, very clean uh, uh, surgical feel. And progressively we remove this residual lesion. And so we uh, radically remove lesion, taking, uh, um, leaving intact the middle meningeal artery that was just behind. The, the lesion itself. And so this is the last door that we will describe in this presentation, the so-called pterygoid process. And I like to divide the, the transpterygoid approach, uh, approaches in two, the superior one and the inferior one. And the limit is the, Vidian, the, line, the line of the Vidian canal. If you go superior to the Vidian canal, you go in this area. So in the area of the cavernous sinus of the Michael cave, and uh, of the Michael cave and Petrus apex. If you go inferior to the Vidian canal, you go in a totally different area. You go in the area of the upper parapharyngeal space. We will start with the superior approach, uh, with the transpterygoid and superior approach, and we uh, we see an example of um, just just to show you an important pathology that is uh, Jovan Island fibroma, but you will see better in the next step with uh, Dr. Jana Kiram. And uh, it is the last uh, step of surgery in which we remove the component in the sphenoid sinus. This is the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. Just to show you as this lesion go uh, along the uh, Vidian canal, and so you need to uh, expose all that area that I showed you before. And so this is the uh, lesion that we are pushing down towards the mouth because it's very big. This is the Vidian canal that was expanded, but we will see later. Now we are removing the lesion from the, from the mouth. This is V2. This is the uh, area of the Vidian canal, the foramen lacerum. And you see how much if you go in this direction, you go towards the area of the cavernous sinus and nacal cave. And if you want to approach the cavernous sinus, as, as, you, uh, as you, you can do in big uh, between adenomas, you have to follow also this route. And so superiorly, transpterygoid superiorly to the uh, Vidian, Vidian canal. You have always to remove the pterygoid in such a case because you need to have your surgical field, that your dangerous surgical field that is the cavernous sinus, uh, in front of you and in the center of your field. You can also re, uh, reach this area starting from a more midline approach, but if you have any trouble or any problem of bleeding, you, you, you have not a direct uh, route towards the uh, cavernous sinus. And so I wanted to conclude my presentation with the inferior pterygoid process, transpterygoid approaches. These inferior transpterygoid approaches uh, go inferiorly in respect to the line of the Vidian canal and can also divide it in two different approaches, medial and lateral to the lateral pterygoid plate. The medial axis is medial to the lateral pterygoid plate. Here I'm removing the last portion of the palatine uh, bone and, of, and opening the pterygoid Fossa, this is the medial pterygoid plate that I will remove, and the lateral pterygoid plate that you can leave also in surgery during nasopharyngectomy if you don't need to extend too much lateral, because it's a good landmark also for the carotid artery, but it depends from the kinking of the parapharyngeal carotid artery. This is the pterygoid fossa. This is the medial pterygoid muscle that we will cut. This is the torium tubarius, and this is the tube. 
we are going into the nasopharynx. The first muscular structure after the cutting of the medial, uh, of the medial pterygoid muscle is the tensor veli palatini muscle that has a vertical direction. This is the tube. I cut the um, tensor veli palatini muscle and you see the levator veli palatini muscle that is the second muscle that you will, uh, you will meet. The, you see the different direction that is more oblique, and this is the tube. And so we are progressively skeletonized the tube. Now we, we cut also the tensor, veli, uh, the, the levator veli palatini muscle, and so you see the tube here. Here we have the lateral pterygoid plate, and here in this area, you don't need to expose always, but in, for very extended tumor, yes. You have also V3, you see that here we clean, and you can see the tube, V3, and lateral pterygoid uh, plate. Here we clean very well in order to expose the carotid sheets, and so you, so you see how much you are close to the carotid when you are in this step of surgery, when you have to cut the tube, you have behind the carotid artery. And so in this step is the step where is very important, the Doppler, as I told you before, especially because the, your assistant is pulling usually the soft tissue from lateral to medial with a black sleeve, um, from lateral to medial, is pulling in order to give you space to cut the tissues, but pulling the tissue, pull also the carotid. And so always check, even if you are more medial than, uh, than you think, uh, but if you pull the tissue, always check with the Doppler before cutting because you have you can have you can also pull the uh, parapharyngeal carotid artery. This is an example of a nasopharyngeal endoscopic resection. This is a salivary uh, gland uh, low grade tumor, is an adenocarcinoma. And so we start with the harvesting of the nasoceptal flap for the subsequent reconstruction. We perform the posterior septectomy, and now we are uh, in the pterygopalatine fossa, that is maxillary artery. We clip the maxillary artery because we have to expose the, uh, pterygoid, uh, the pterygoid root. Now we are on the posterior wall of the, of the nasopharynx, delimiting our, our uh, surgical field. This is the lateral pterygoid plates that was preserved in order to have our landmarks. And now this is, you see, he's pulling and we are cutting the tube, but before we, uh, we check also with the Doppler. And after that uh, very, very uh, difficult maneuver, we uh, finish to remove uh, all, also through the mouth all the, all the, uh, specimen, all the specimen of, of surgery. And then we put the nasoceptal flap in order to cover the area of the carotid area and those uh, and also the bone of the sphenoid that was drilled out. And the last, the last root in the upper parapharyngeal space is the root lateral to the lateral pterygoid plate. Here we have the lateral pterygoid plate that was removed. If you go lateral to it, this is the medial pterygoid muscle. If you remove, this is the tensor belly palatini muscle, the tube uh, viewed from lateral. This is V3, as you, you saw before. This is a very important structure. This is the stylopharyngeal fascia. If you open this, you enter into the parapharyngeal space, okay? And so the nasopharynx is here, and you have here the parapharyngeal antenna carotid artery, the ninth, the tenth, the jugular vein, and this is also the styled process, okay? And so, in conclusion, we can also reach the orbital, uh, the, the, the petroclival junction and the petrous apex. Uh, if you go medial and inferior to the, um, to the, to the carotid artery uh, in the area of the foramen lacerum, you can see here with the median nerve. This is an example of a simple case, but is, is, uh, is in a very critical area. This is a, a cholesteatoma of the petrous apex. You can see here the, um, where is the petrous apex very clearly. This is the paraclival carotid artery. We are opening the sphenoid. We are drilling all the septa because if you have to put any kind of, uh, any kind of flap after surgery, you, you need to have all the bony exposed without any remain um, in any any piece of mucosa into the sphenoid sinus. Always be very careful in the exposure and then you start with your lesion. You see that the floor of the sphenoid is totally, totally exposed. And now we start with the removal of the lesion 
and we decided for a cavitation, leaving the leaving the matrix uh, on the on the margins of the lesion because it was not possible to remove all the malign, uh, all, all the all the margins of the of all the matrix of the cholesteatoma also deeply, and so we decided not to put the flap because the matrix of the lesion was already something surfacing the cavity, and so. The, the cavity uh, remained open after six months from the section, and this was the uh, cavity after surgery. And so, in conclusion, I want to say to you that you must be flexible. I described in this presentation all the transnasal roots for sagittal and coronal areas, but you don't have to forget, to forget that there are several other approaches, a lot of other approaches that you can do to reach a lesion of the skull base and you, another important concept that you can combine in multiportal surgery. And so, but this was not the topic of this presentation. I want to conclude, uh, thanks all my group uh, that uh, did these excellent pictures that you saw and we uh, in few months have uh, our publication of our endoscopic transnasal anatomy of the skull base and the adjutant areas atlas. And uh, I want to invite you and probably also Nasusan Association to our International Summer School of June. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Alberto, for this amazing presentation. We, I think and I hope that uh, all the delegates are appreciating the amazing uh, pictures, anatomical pictures that you provided very, very high definition with all the landmarks, with all the, the structures that has been signed so everyone could be able to see and in the future due to the fact that we are recording those kind of, um, of webinars, the people will be able to rejoin and watch once again to use as a scientific and educational material. Thank you again for the for the presentation and for the for the invitation for the for this uh, summer school, I would like to start with some uh, some questions. Plus, uh, I I would like to ask the delegates uh, to ask a question to you. The first two questions that I have are mainly based on uh, resurfacing. Uh, then we will uh, lead uh, the uh, delegates uh, for their um, questions. The first question is. Uh, um, the the racer facing you you were um, you were talking about the, the nasoceptal flap for reconstruction um, but my question is uh, what about and uh, what are the other indication for um, reconstruction especially in those cases where the high flow of a CSF are coming uh, down like uh, are any differences for tailoring uh, those kind of um, uh, flaps uh, in uh, in the different uh, perspective and the different approaches, like uh, if uh, you are dealing with uh, those uh, transcribiform and uh, some of the transplantum approaches, uh, or what are you using for transplantum transtubercular uh, tuberculum cell uh, um, lesions? Are different flows requiring different flaps, or are you always using the same flaps? This is the first question. And the second question is, uh, um, what are the indication for the, the last, uh, um, what are the, the indication for the last pathology that you were talking about, about the cholesterol granuloma? Are the, those kind of uh, uh, diseases could be always treated um, through the nose uh, or there are some kind of uh, diseases that could be reached just simply through the nose and some of the other are cannot be done. Okay. Uh, yes, the last one was not a cholesterol granuloma, but a cholesteatoma. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but in general, the lesion of that area obviously should be also always be uh, evaluated by uh, ENT and the neurosurgeon together in order to understand when you can uh, reach the lesion via an endoscopic approach that is. Uh, better for venin lesion, but also for chondrosarcomas of that areas, uh, when you can reach via an endoscopic approach 
sometimes is, is better. But if you have, for example, a big chordoma of the lower clivus with a um, very big uh, with, uh, or so significant intracranial extension, you have always to consider, we, you usually consider uh, two steps. Uh, the first step uh, by an endoscopic approach through the nose and um, the first, uh, the first through the nose, and uh, a second step uh, um, through uh, uh, external approach, neurosurgical approach from the intracranial and lateral component, intradural, sorry, intradural and lateral component. What about reconstruction? That is a, a very, uh, a very big uh, topic. Uh, we have totally different techniques. If you are speaking about anterior skull base middle skull base and posterior skull base. Uh, the best to start is the anterior skull base. It's very easy for a skull base surgeons because you have, even if you can have a big uh, defect, you see after transcribed from approach, we have a big defect, but paradoxically, sometimes big defects are more easily to be repaired than small defects. And uh, always remember that in anterior skull base, uh, if you have, uh, a defect in the anterior skull base more than a very small defect because if you have a very small defect that can stop after using of a bipolar uh, uh, and the, the CSF stop after the use of bipolar, okay, you can use very easily just a, a overlay technique with a, with a graft. But if you have bigger lesions, bigger bigger holes in the in the dura, probably is always better consider the vascularized flap, in my opinion, but you can close also only with grafts. Uh, we have, we had during the last years a lot of discussion about anterior skull base reconstruction, about the use of vascularized flap or graft. We described uh, a very useful technique, the free layer technique with the iliotibial tract for anterior skull base big defect after transcriptive form approach. We demonstrate that we have a very low rate of CSF leak. However, I tell you, if you have a nasoceptal flap or a vascularized flap, it's always better, it's safer, and it, also, it is also easier in the post-operative period because you have less crusting and everything. But there are situations like sinonasal tumors in which you don't have the possibility to invest any vascularized flap. For middle cell base, it's different. The flow is higher, and so, uh, if you have a small defect after transphenoidal transcellular approach, okay, you can use uh, just uh, just a, a graft or or another septal flap. But if you have, if you open the cistern, if you perform a transtuberculum approach, we always perform, if it is possible, a, a gasket seal uh, reconstruction with fascia fat and cartilage from the nose with covering of the nasoceptal flap. And for the last areas, that is the most difficult areas, the lower clivus, that is very, very difficult area to reconstruct, also for uh, the geometrical uh, anatomy and, uh, this, and the conformation of this area, always we, you have to, you need to have, you must have a very, very good flap, also both uh, from both sides, two nasoceptal flaps, and so you have to combine the different grafts uh, posteriorly with FEPS, uh, cartilage, and fascia. Perform a very, very strong gasket seal technique in order to block your grafts component of the of the of the reconstruction and put your nasoceptal flaps uh, covering all your grafts. If you have any doubt about this nasoceptal flap or you need to revise this reconstruction, in my opinion, the best option that could be also considered as first option is the temporal parietal facial flap because it's very vascularized, it's very thick, and help, can help you, especially if you have any, any doubt about infections. Oh, I have a question from the Emirates. Uh, Aziz is asking, are you always using a navigation uh, in, uh, in uh, skull base surgery? Mm, I, I should. <laughs> no, really, uh, yes. Um, no, 
for posterior skull base, we usually use uh, navigation. We have always in the OR, and this is an important concept. You should have, but uh, usually I, I, I don't use for the reason that I told you before. Yes, there are specific cases in which you need navigation and you have to use uh, obsolete and, uh, and whenever. But uh, most of the time I, I saw that uh, you don't need really navigation, but also because it's not so, uh, it's not so precise because uh, the same things that I told you before. Most of the time you have to remove a lesion that moves the soft tissues and so especially for nasopharynx but also for chordomas, no? when you remove the lesion and the lesion is pushing some structures, when you remove the lesion the structures came, came back. But to understand when you are during the resection is not so precise to avoid for example damage of the 12 for, for the 6 but to give you an orientation, yes, it's very important. And so for posterior skull base, we always use navigation. And uh, for anterior skull base, I use navigation. And also for middle skull base, we use navigation uh, only in selective cases. Okay. Uh, I have another question from Piotr from, uh, from Russia. He's asking, uh, what are your imaging, uh, preoperative imaging studies uh, for uh, uh, planning? Excuse me, can, can you repeat? Um, what are the preoperative imaging you're requesting for? Uh, I guess that he was asking what kind of preoperative assessment radiologically are you requesting for uh, such, yeah. uh, such cases? Yes, it depends because I, I show you uh, several um, several routes with uh, uh, totally different uh, pathologies, and so uh, you need the images for first of all for for a correct diagnosis of the lesion, first of all, and second you need the radiology, a good radiology, also to uh, to have a guide for 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 surgery. Uh, obviously, MRI in uh, almost all uh, the lesions of the skull base is uh, the gold standard and the best. If you have a good MRI, it's very important. But uh, not uh, forgot that there are also other radiological techniques that can help you in the preoperative assessment, specifically in the situation in which you are working very close to some uh, very important vascular structures like carotid artery. For example, if you have a nasopharyngeal tumor or a posterior clivus tumor that, that, are going, uh, that are going very close to the carotid, probably uh, angiography with a balloon test of the carotid could be useful in order to uh, also from under a uh, medical legal uh, point of view to know if you have uh, any compensation in case of blowout of carotid eh? or in other situation also considers but in very very extreme uh, cases we also uh, closed the carotid a couple of times and so but obviously you have to uh, to discuss uh, your case uh, before think about, uh, uh, but I think that MRI, first of all, CT scan can help you uh, to know if you have some uh, bony um, alterations or uh, bony remnants, uh, if you need, can, can help you also CT scan to guide you during surgery or for also for navigation or to fuse MRI and CT scan during navigation. But uh, first of all, uh, you need a good imaging to uh, have all the information about the nature of the lesion. Never start with a, such a kind of surgery without knowing exactly what you are, uh, what, what is your lesion. You, have, you need a diagnosis before. Um, I think that there's uh, only one question uh, that we could uh, allow to do due to, to the time. Uh, and I would like to express this one from Armando from uh, South America. And his question is, uh, if, uh, I guess, there's, uh, if, uh, if you're always performing uh, uh, dissection anteriorly to posterior to uh, decompression of the orbit in cases of malignancy of the anterior skull base. 
Mm, no, no. The decompression of the orbit? No. No, no. He's, uh, I guess uh, he was uh, asking if you expose uh, uh, from the lamina papyracea to the sign, uh, so to the sphenous sinuses uh, in uh, malignancy of the anterior scopulus. No, I'm sorry if, if uh, showing you the anatomical dissection, uh, I, I show you that you can potentially also remove the papyracea and uh, if you need the periorbit, but remember one concept, you have always to follow con uh, oncological concept. Uh, especially in the nose, you have a box with uh, some anatomical limits that are very important to preserve whenever are not involved by the tumor. If you don't need, because you have no a direct invasion, for example, of the periorbit or of the dura, okay, yes, sometimes you need to remove uh, because of free ma because you need to reach free margins. But if you don't need it, leave it because you have to remember that the periorbit as the dura, or periosteum in general, are natural barrier for tumor, for tumor spreading, okay? And so, if you have to remove because you have a direct contact of the tumor, of course you have to remove because you need to be radical. But if you have, for example, the tumor on, uh, in the ethmoid without any sign of, uh, of contact with the papyracea, don't have to remove preparation and periorbit because you have to reach one centimeter of, uh, of, uh, of margin. Because this is another concept, uh, another concept, the, the piece mirror section in the nose, differently from open, uh, open, uh, uh, open surgery in the neck, for example, for oncology. And so sometimes, yes, you have to remove your margins, like periorbit or like the skull base, but remember that you are removing a barrier uh, for tumor spread. In, in so if you don't need, and you don't have any sign of contact with the tumor, please leave it because you have always to think, for example, in sinonasal tumor, you have an high rate of local relapse. If you have, for example, a tumor quite low in the nose and you leave the dura, you have can still remove the dura in order to reach a good margin. If you already remove the dura and you uh, you uh, and you add a relapse of the tumor, the relapse, the intracranium the, towards the, the, the cranium is more critical because your barrier was previously removed and so the spreading of the tumor is not under control. Hoping that was clear my... my yes, yes my, I, I guess, I guess. Uh, yes. Uh, obviously, when you have to standardize uh, a, 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 a resection, a, a surgical technique, you show all the steps, the possible steps, <laughs> yes. as in an anatomical book. But obviously, not all steps have to be performed for, uh, for example, transcribing from approach. For example, you can also, um, we recently published, you can also perform a unilateral resection for uh, intestinal type adenocarcinoma if you have a tumor that is confined to only one side of the nose. And so you can leave intact the left side and you can remove the dura only on the side of the tumor, for example. So you have to customize, but you have always to follow the oncological concepts. And this is very interesting because uh, since uh, the last uh, seven, eight years, uh, everything's changed. Uh, we changed uh, through a perspective in which we basically were uh, approaching uh, monolateral uh, diseases, uh, opening both sinuses uh, and both box. And right now we switched once again because of the studies and, and, and the difficult and the different uh, um, articles also prove that uh, monolateral could be enough. And, and, and I know that uh, mainly the, the, the Brescia and the Barese School are, are publishing those kind of uh, researches and, uh, and we are really thankful for those kind of, uh, of, uh, of studies. Um, thank you again, uh, Dr. Alberto Schreiber and all the delegates yeah. for participating. I would like to have you once again for the next uh, second session uh, in the 2019 to 2020, and I will be, uh, be glad to join uh, your summer school that, uh, this summer. Thank you, uh, uh, everybody. I would like to uh, express my gratitude to Alberto Schreiber, and I uh, would like to remind you next appointment, 1st March, 
We will go live for a surgical uh, procedure with Dr. Janikan from India. And uh, in this, uh, um, the next uh, step, uh, we will uh, um, approach different lesion in a different ways. Plus, uh, this time is going to be 9 a.m., 8.30 a.m. in the morning, wrong time. So please uh, join and use once again the, the previous uh, registration um, uh, link that we provided. Thank you again and uh, uh, see you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.